Hello to everybody, I'm Marco Beato, Associate Professor in Sport and Exercise Science at University of Suffolk. Today, I will talk with you about load quantification and testing using flywheel devices in sport. This is also a new episode of Understanding Sport Science hosted by University of Suffolk and me. I want to start this presentation explaining the background of flywheel training. This type of training was initially proposed to mitigate the neuromuscular dysfunctions and concurrent sarcopenia caused by the absence of gravity during space travels in astronauts. In this slide, you can see a schematic representation of a stack machine, and on the right, another representation of a flywheel device. The main difference between the two devices is that the stack machine needs gravity for developing a resistance why the flywheel device does not need that, since it's a technology that is gravity independent. For such a reason, flywheel devices were used to contrast the negative effect of gravity on muscular functions in astronauts during space travels. Why is training so important during space travels? And why did we need this type of device? Because space flights have been associated with the decrement of muscle and performance parameters in the order of 2% a week during the initial phase of a mission, which was an important health and performance issue for astronauts. Therefore, despite the reported benefits of resistant training in terms of muscle strength and muscle gains, isotonic exercise such as weight stack machine or free weights could not be used because of our gravity dependent exercises. This was the initial rationale for the implementation of flywheel training in this specific scenario. After the first pioneering studies, sports scientists and later on practitioners understood the advantages offered by flywheel technology and they started to use it for training purposes such as performance development injury prevention and clinical rehabilitation. For instance, this paper published by Tesh in 2004 found that flywheel training is capable to develop some significant chronic adaptation in only a few weeks of training. But what is the rationale that supports the implementation of flywheel training? Eccentric exercise, which is a component of flywheel exercise, has some unique characteristic compared to both concentric and isometric contractions. For instance, a centric contraction is accompanied by higher force output production compared to concentric or isometric contraction. Lower energy expenditure compared with both isometric and concentric muscle contraction, resulting in a greater work efficiency during eccentric training. This greater force production and efficiency are attributed to a higher number of attached cross bridges and by the tensile contribution of the passive structure elements engaging within the sarcoma under lengthening, so during the eccentric phase. Moreover, in this slide, you can see a systematic review published by Douglas that summarizes the evidence of eccentric training. This review reports that the chain training can improve muscle mechanical function to a greater extent than other modalities. Additionally, a chain training can induce chronic neural adaptation, for instance, increase motor unit synchronization, as well as morphological adaptation, structure of the muscle tendinous units, for example. However, flywheel training benefits are not only related to the eccentric phase, but they are due to the combination of both concentric and eccentric contraction during the same exercise. Although the concentric contraction in flywheel exercise has received low interest compared to the eccentric contraction, it plays a key role in the obtainment of specific adaptation, both neural and morphological. And this is a necessary component for development of the subsequent eccentric contraction. In this specific slide, you can see that there is a comparison between a stack machine on the left and a flywheel device on the right. You can see that the dominant phase using the stack machine is the concentric contraction, where we can find a higher power 
force and the electromyography. But these parameters are underloaded in the eccentric phase. This is quite clear from the picture. While if you watch on the right, you can see that the flywheel training can develop power, force, and generate muscle activation in both phases. If you check in detail, you can see that the eccentric phase is a bit more demanding. But anyway, both phases are well loaded. That is a key characteristic of this type of training. In this slide, you can see a meta-analysis published by Manotis Gerber that reports that the benefits of flywheel training in terms of strength, power, muscle power, and hypertrophy, as well as he reports some specific adaptation, such as jump and speed performance enhancement. The evidence that we have in our hands are not limited to this paper published by Manotis Gerber, but we have several other papers that support this type of technology. Moreover, we have this recent publication that showed that flywheel training is a safe and time effective strategy to enhance physical, physical outcomes with young and elderly females. This systematic review suggests practitioners to prescribe flywheel training as an effective way to prevent muscle injuries or falls in the elderly population, as well as it is a potent stimulus for physical enhancement in the young female population. There is also another paper that supports flywheel training. This study is a very important one because it summarizes the guidelines for the use of this training method. This paper reports, as you can see in the table on the right, the advantages, limitations, and future direction of this technology. I will not read the advantages here reported because you can find them in the original paper. This paper was published in Frontiers Physiology, which is an open access journal, and you can download the paper there for free. Instead, I want to focus my attention on one of the limitations, that is the lack of standard procedures for exercise loading, prescription, and monitoring. As you can see in this slide, this is exactly the key point of this presentation, because we have just published a paper on this topic titled Load Quantification and Testing Using Flywheel Devices in Sport. I take the opportunity to acknowledge the authors involved in this paper. This study was published on Frontiers Physiology and can be downloaded for free. If you cannot find the paper and you see this presentation, you are interested in it, please email me and I will send you the link to the journal. So now we can progress to the second part of this presentation. In this slide, you can find a force and velocity profile specific for a gravity dependent exercise. On the top left on the picture, you can see that the force is high, but the velocity is low, which is an adequate condition for the development of maximal strength. In the middle of the curve, you can see that we have a combination of force and speed, which is indicated for the development of power. While in the motor ram, in the bottom right, you can see movements which require higher velocity and lower force production. Using a flywheel exercise, it is possible to recreate exactly the same profile, but there is an important difference between gravity-dependent exercise and flywheel exercises. The intensity of resistance print program has been traditionally prescribed relatively to the maximum strength based on the percentage of one repetition maximum, the famous one RM. However, this is not possible with flywheel device because they are not gravity dependent. Therefore, we need to find different solutions when we use this type of technology. For this reason, it is important to quantify kinetic and kinematic variables such as velocity, power, or force during both concentric and eccentric actions of the flywheel exercise to individually monitor and adjust training volume and intensity to fit the needs of each participant. Before to show you this video that I've prepared, I want to explain what happened during, during the exercise. During flywheel exercise, the users need to accelerate the inertia wheels of the device during the concentric phase, that is the positive one, when we go up in this case which they will return the stored energy during the following eccentric phase of the exercise, 
So when we will go down in the negative phase of the squat. During this breaking phase, the users need to progressively decelerate the flywheel wheel and invert the movement, returning to perform the consecutive movement. An important note on the acceleration, this is a key point. Some specific braking technique can be used in this phase to accelerate or decelerate the movement and accentuate, in particular, the effort. This is not the topic of today, but remember that this exists. So one technique is uh, to decelerate the movement during the eccentric phase, and this deceleration is gradual. The other one is to use some specific braking technique and decelerate in a specific range of motion of the movement. In this way, you can stimulate more the eccentric contraction in that specific range of motion. That can make a lot of sense when we talk about injury prevention. Frequently, or as you can see in this specific video, the deceleration in the eccentric phase, in this case, is a, a constant deceleration. There is no specific breaking technique. But then let's watch the video now. Now we can change topic and we can talk about flywheel test. Currently, we don't have much evidence about this specific argument, but very recently we have developed a new flywheel squat test protocol aiming to evaluate muscle adaptation in sports such as mechanical power. This test, this test consists of three sets of six repetition, two initial repetition were added to attain the initial momentum using an inertial load of 0.06. This test reported excellent test retest reliability for concentric and eccentric power outputs, ICC 0.94, 0.95, and reported the existence of a significant linear relationship with isokinetic, concentric, and eccentric parameters. The study reports in this slide can be found in the Journal of Sports Science and was published there in 2020. If you need further information about this protocol or you have any type of question on the, the paper, please download the paper or email me and I will try to answer you. I want to conclude this presentation with a brief summary. This article just published reports the background and the rationale of the use of flywheel exercise in sport, starting from the first pioneering studies to the latest evidence about load monitoring and testing using flywheel devices. The study reports that both inertia power and inertia velocity relationship can be used to design the profile of a given flywheel exercise, which can be used for assessing training adaptation and progress. Moreover, the optimal inertia load can be assessed using a progressive testing protocol evaluating the peak power. This approach allows to individualize the load for each participant based on their own physical characteristic. Lastly, a flywheel squat test protocol developed to evaluate muscle adaptation has been recently validated. And you have seen that uh, just above. Reporting excellent test retest reliability for concentric and eccentric power outputs. So thank you very much for your attention during this presentation. If you have any questions related to what I've just explained, please email me and I will try to answer you or leave a comment below. I take this opportunity to ask you to continue to follow this channel, Understanding Sports Science, which is hosted by University of Suffolk and me. Thank you very much.